Those of you who have been regular would know that we have been having a systematic study from the book of Acts from the first chapter onwards. And today we are going to look at chapter 6 and 7. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom we will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word this proposal pleased the whole group they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit also Philip Prochorus Nicanor Timon Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So here is the first passage where you all know what is really happening. The church is growing in number. A lot of people are being added and that is how this chapter starts. That is how Luke is putting it. There was an increase in the number of disciples, not membership of the church, but rather disciples. This is a beautiful term that he is using because most of the time we would use, you know, words like believers or members of the church. But here he is using the word disciples. Everyone who was added to their number actually automatically became a disciple. What is a disciple? Who is a disciple? A disciple actually means a learner. Mathetes, it is called. What is the agenda of the church? At that point of time, they did not have any other agenda except this one primary agenda, which was teachings of Jesus, presenting Jesus. This was the most important thing. Yes, understanding the teachings of Jesus, you understand God and you also have fellowship with one another. But the most important focus was the teachings of Jesus. And any person who was willing to learn the teachings of Jesus and accepted those teachings into his life or her life was considered a disciple. So this is very important for us to understand. They all become not, they all become not just believers, they all become just members of the church, but really they are called disciples. And we find as the disciples increase, again, when there is an increase in number, there is always prone to be a little bit of friction, right? When two people are there, maybe, you know, it's not going to be as tough as having, you know, 10 people because then 10 people's mindsets and everything comes to play. As the disciples increased, so did the problems, so did the, you know, misunderstanding. So what was the misunderstanding here? It looks like the church has been taking care of the widows. Again, you know, Luke has not talked about it earlier in detail. But right now we know that the church is taking care of the widows. Because at that point of time, we need to understand that it was a male chauvinistic society. Right? Where women had actually, you know, very uh, little respect. And they, they were not able to fend for themselves. They were not able to because they could not work. They were not allowed to work. They were not given education. So they are supposed to be at home. And if the father is not there or the husband is not there, that means this woman is left without any means to feed herself and take care of herself. So at this point of time, widows, anyone who's not, been able, who's not able to take care of themselves are taken care of by the church, at that point of time, this is how it is. So it's a beautiful you know, paradigm. This is a beautiful system that we all need to follow. You know, anyone who's in need, last week we looked at that. Anyone who was in need, anyone who was not able to take care of themselves was taken care of by the church. So we do not know, you know how many people were there. But it looks like there were a lot of people, widows aren't there and they had been taken care of by the church. But there is a kind of a division there. What is the problem? That some widows are neglected at the cost of other widows okay so there is some kind of a favoritism that is at work you know nepotism you know the word nepotism nepotism means being favorable to someone close to you okay that means nepotism okay and uh, favoritism is at play and they say hellenistic jews who are these Helleni uh, hellenistic jews hellenistic means greek okay hebraic obviously means the 
Hebrew language, okay? So there are there is a division between the Jews themselves, okay? And it is very humorous for us, okay? So we, we have other divisions, right? We have other divisions like caste and color and creed and things like that. But even then, them, they are all Jews, yet they have this distinction because some of them are speaking Jewish language. Some of them have, uh, you know, taken the Greek language as their language. So they are not very pure, according to these Jews, okay? They are not very pure, pure because they have, you know, embraced the, the, the Hellenistic or the uh, Greek culture, right? So there is a division there. And now what is happening here? The, uh, they are bringing this problem to the disciples. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together. That is in verse number 2, right? And it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order for us to wait on tables. What are these people saying? Why are the disciples saying this? Are they demeaning t waiting on tables? Are they demeaning waiting on tables? They are saying, you know, we will only focus on ministering the word, teaching the word. We will not neglect doing that for waiting on tables. It looks like they are demeaning, but the next verse clarifies this to us, where it says, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you to wait on tables, right? And they have to be full of the spirit and wisdom. So they have a very huge criteria that they keep for them to wait on tables. Now we understand that this was not a you know, responsibility that they shunned or said, okay, this was not so very important. In fact, they are giving so much importance that it only, not only in function, because it is very important, but also in priority, where they are saying, this waiting on tables should be done by people who are full of, full of faith and full of wisdom. Full of the spirit and full of wisdom. I'm sorry, the full, of, full of the spirit and full of wisdom. What does it mean? What did the Spirit enable them to do? This is what we have been looking at all through the book of Acts, right? What is the Spirit enabling them to do? That they are able to be witnesses. And why are they witnessing? So that other people could be a part of the kingdom. So anyone who has got this understanding of God, the right understanding of God, today we talk about a different thing. When we say, oh, I've got the spirit, we don't talk about this at all. But they, when they were talking about the spirit, they were talking about a person who has understood the idea of God, where they knew that, you know, they were proclaiming the kingdom and people had to come into the kingdom so that they could, uh, you know, have this beautiful life with God. And everyone who had that and wisdom, why wisdom? Because they have to deal with people. They have to be impartial. They have to be very responsible. So they are finding these people, seven of them, and they are saying, from now on, this is your responsibility. We will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This is what we are going to focus on. Okay. So now they are choosing seven people and there, you know, one person is given a specific kind of a, uh, importance. Who is that? They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip and so on and so forth, right? Seven people are there. You know, this is one of Luke's uh, technique every time you would find it, that he would mention someone in an offhand ma manner, and then the next step would be focusing on them. He would present someone, introduce someone, and later on he is going to expand on that. So he is talking about Stephen, and this man was full of faith, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. Why is he being, is he being chosen? Because he knows the idea of God. Because he has the power, he has the, you know, the, the spirit by which he is going to witness. He has the same idea as God has, and he is going to bring about uh, that kingdom of God. And this is very important. He is a man who is impartial. There are partial people, and we we find people, seven people are chosen so that they can be impartial, so that they can meet out to the people without being, without showing any kind of a favoritism. So we have the impartial man, Stephen, along with the seven of those people. So today's message is going to revolve around this particular character, Stephen. So we have the introduction where he's introduced us as one among the seven who is going to be impartial, who is going to understand the you know mind of God, who is going to witness, who is going to establish that kingdom of God and equality. It is beautiful. And then he goes on where he says, though the word of God spread, 
the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So here we find again, uh, you know, the, the gospel is spreading and a lot of people are coming into the kingdom of God. It is beautiful. Then verse number 9 or 8 onwards, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, this is when we know, you know, the, the story is going to shift more into focusing Stephen. The, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. How was Stephen being introduced? Two things that, that are being told about Stephen. One, yeah, full of faith and full of, oh, I'm sorry, full of God's grace and power, right? Earlier he was talked about as a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And before that, when the twelve were saying, you know, choose seven people who are full of the spirit and of wisdom. So it looks like all of these qualities are there in Stephen, right? And what is the second thing that has been talked about about him? He is also performing miracles, right? So two aspects, his deed and who he is, right? Who he is and what he, what he did. Two things are talked about about Stephen here, okay? And we find that this again is a man who is introduced as a man full of grace and power, meaning he's understood God. And he goes about performing signs among, prof, uh, among the people. You know, why is this attributed to Stephen? Even in the, even in the earlier passages, we find sometimes that uh, the apostles are, 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 are described as people who performed wonders and miracles. Were they the ones who were performing wonders and miracles? Why is it attributed to them then? Were they the ones who were performing miracles? Can anyone heal anybody? Can anyone make the dead people walk? Can, we, can anyone, you know, uh, uh, mm, yeah, perform miracle signs? Who does all of those things? God. So why is it attributed to them then? People attributed it to them, and that is how Luke is presenting it, right? You need to understand this. There is something called metonymy. You know, that's a, this is a concept I wanted to talk about. Metonymy is basically substitution. Even earlier, we would find that uh, there was a verse which says, in the second chapter, where it says that God was adding to their numbers. God was adding many people to their numbers. Who was actually adding? Because of what? Because of their preaching. So who is actually making people come into the kingdom? They are preaching, right? So how is God said to be the person who is bringing people into the kingdom? How is it? Yeah, obviously God is sovereign. We understand that. But, but again, that again is called metonymy. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more example. In the Old Testament, we have you know, passages where it says, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, right? Did really God harden his heart? If God had, you know, really hardened his heart, is there, no, is there any way we can blame him, blame Pharaoh, saying you have a hard heart? Because God had already hardened his heart. It's called metonymy, where one person is substituted for the other. Supposing I say, I built my house there, right, in a particular place. Did I build it? I, I built it, I took the stones and I took, no. I used someone, I had the intent, someone else fulfilled it. But ultimately, I am the one who caused it to happen. And therefore I say, I built it. Okay. So a metonymy is this, that sometimes one person is substituted for the other. So we need to understand that definitely this is not what the apostles were teaching. We are healing. No, they always thought that it was God, but people understood it. And we need to understand this concept of metonymy because in, a, in, in the book of Acts, we would find it in a lot of places. Okay. So I just want you to know that. Then we find that this man is being very powerful. And here, because of that, verse number nine, opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue. And who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So here we find he's a powerful person and people are not, people are opposing him. The synagogue leaders are opposing him. Why are they opposing him? Why did anyone oppose the uh, apostles? Why did anyone oppose Jesus Christ? Here is someone who comes and tells you the truth. And people, because see, truth is a powerful thing. Truth enlightens people, empowers people that they are not going to be slaves anymore. 
right this is what the kingdom of god pro- preaching was all about where they said you don't have to be down anymore you all have to be equal and that's the idea of god and as the as is the case with most of us we don't like the idea of equality we always want to be superior to someone and if everyone knows that they are equal then you have lost your standing you've got your love you've lost your power you cannot exploit anymore and the who were the people who were against him not the common people did the common people put jesus on the cross who put him on the cross it was always the religious leaders because religion again you find it as exploited these people go and preach the kingdom of god and now they are being threatened because religion does not exist if everyone is start that you can have direct access to god so what is the point of having someone whom you have to go through right is that true or not if you can have direct access to god why do you have someone in between why why should you have someone in between so that person when the truth is being taught he is being you know threatened by people knowing the truth and that is exactly what is happening that is why they killed jesus that is why they were always standing against the apostles that is why here also we find they are standing against stephen you know already we know that he is a good guy because you know he has been described as a wonderful person who is impartial who is a good guy who knows about equality he is teaching equality he knows the you know he is a witness to jesus christ all these has already been taught to us and still you know you get the idea if if no introduction is was given maybe we could have thought okay he was a bad person and people were wanting to kill him no it's already established that he was a wonderful person and why are they standing against him because he is standing in the way of them exploiting this is an important thing for us to understand if you preach the gospel if you really understand the gospel if you really understand the kingdom values you would definitely be against exploitation and you would definitely be a kind of a reformer you would be impactful you know look at this this guy has uh, you know so very impactful he's performed some miracles he is going and preaching the gospel and they feel so threatened and they want to accuse him they don't have anything you know true to say against him so they go about creating false witness is where they come up and say what he was speaking against Moses he was speaking against the law they are trying to you know kindle a kind of a tense situation there where people would be against Stephen but in fact Stephen was a such a wonderful such a good person so could this happen to us it would but we need to be it is our one it is our responsibility that we impact the world with the gospel you know sometimes when you disillusion people you know those people who are disillusioned might be happy but the people who had kept them under the illusion are going to be very very angry with you but this is our responsibility our duty like stephen did you know most of the prophets in the old testament did that even yesterday as we were looking at the book of ezekiel this is what we understood that you know that people that god wants us to go and what what is doing as well basically this proclaiming the kingdom proclaiming the kingdom is this about equality about the kingdom of god when you do that people are going to stand against you but god says even to the prophets because they were all reformers let me tell you all of the prophets were reformers they had to stand against people not because they did not love the people they loved people but because they had the passion to set everything right and therefore people are going to be against them an impactful man that he is being that people are being threatened by him so they stirred up the people look at verse number 12 they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law they seized stephen and brought him before the sanhedrin they produced false witnesses who testified this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law for we have heard him say that this jesus of nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs moses handed down to us did moses teach exploitation did moses teach them that they can lord over other people you know where did these pharisees and sadducees and all of these uh, you know religious leader come from did they come from the you know teachings of uh, moses now they are creating stories where they are saying stephen was against moses and his teachings but were they really was he really against moses and his teachings no who are the ones who are actually against moses and his teachings the people who claim that they are teaching them you get the idea this is what happens in today's world as well you teach the right thing people are going to stand against you let me tell you okay if you teach the biblic the bible or the scriptures rightly people are going to stand up against you because that is going to bring down you know the power 
that's going to bring down the influence that's going to bring down you know the the status that certain people do have because of exploiting so this man is being very impactful and in all of these things Look at that verse number 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. After all of these things have happened, he is sitting there unperturbed. Now here we find an impartial Stephen, the first part of it. Then we find a very impactful uh, Stephen. He is going and impacting, you know, with his words and with his deeds that even though the exploiters are being threatened. And now we have a very impressive man. Chapter 7, verse number 1. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? Stephen has been waiting for this opportunity. Verse number 2 to verse number 52, he goes on non-stop, okay? One question was asked. What was the question? All these things, were they true? And now he goes on. He starts from Abraham. Then he goes to Isaac. He talks about Jacob. He talks about Joseph. He talks about the slavery in Egypt. He talks about Moses, how he was called, how he was born. He talks about the burning bush experience. He talks about the Exodus, how he was the redeemer. He talks about how from the mountain he was coming down with the commandments and people were worshiping, worshiping golden calf. And how, you know, he is the one who was instrumental in building the tabernacle and later on the temple. He has given the whole history of Israel, all for all for what question? You know, certain times we do that. Okay, recently I was teaching in a you know a couple of people. Okay, and I asked him, you know, are you prepared for the exam? He says, any question comes, this is all we know. We're going to write it. Okay, any question is asked, immediately you dump everything that you know. Let the teacher sort it out. Right? I will just put everything. This is all there in the book. It's almost like this kid, uh, you know, who was reciting A, B, C, D, you know, as he was going to bed. And the mom came and said, what are you doing? You're going to sleep. You are supposed to pray now. Right? And uh, this kid is, uh, you know, reciting A, B, C, D to Z. And uh, the mom was asking, what are you doing? And this kid said, you know, I don't know any prayers. So I'm just giving the alphabet to God. Let him make whatever he wants with that. This man is almost saying everything that he could. Why is he saying that? Why is he doing that? Why is he giving the history of Israel when they are asking one simple question? All that we said, all, all the accusations that they are saying about you, are they true? And he goes about from Abraham to the temple. Why is he doing that? Did he not understand the question? What does the question got to do with his answer? What does his answer got to do with his question? He has impressed them. He's almost dazzled them with his mastery over the scriptures. They asked him a question. We hear that people that you have spoken against Moses. And this man is dazzling them with the scriptural knowledge that he has. You know, sometimes our scriptural knowledge is not like this. You know, we are, we are messed up, right? Scriptural knowledge, yeah, most of us, a lot of Christians know a lot of, uh, you know, verses and chapters. Chapter verses, chapter verse Christians, right? That is us. We do not know context. We do not know the, 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 uh, anything, the, the message. We only know what? Particular passages picked up from here and there, right? There was this man... Who was, uh, you know, there was this local church where they wanted a pastor. They needed a pastor. So they said, okay, the com committee was there. They said, let's hire a pastor, right? And uh, so they had this uh, uh, advertisement and, uh, you know, people came and said, okay, I would like to be the pastor. So there was this young guy, like 24, 25. So they were not really, they looked at him and said, okay, let's see, let's test him. So they asked him the question, do you know the Bible? And they said, uh, this man said, you're going to be our pastor. I'm like, if you want to be our pastor, you know, how much do you know the Bible? This man says, anything that you can ask, you know, I can always tell you, you know. Please, please go ahead. Feel free to ask any question. He said, yeah, just tell us a parable. Okay. And he says, what parable? And they said, uh, yeah, the, the, old, the, the Good Samaritan parable. Please tell us. So the man said, you know what? <clears throat> there was a Samaritan who was very good. And he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And on the way to Jericho, he, he fell among thorns. And they, they choked him half to death. And as he was lying there, Solomon and his wife Gomorrah went that way. And uh, as they went that way, they found him there. They had compassion on him. And they gave him, you know, wine and, and, and oil. And they put him on their donkey. And they were taking him to the Ark of Moses. As they were taking him to the Ark of Moses, as they were entering the eastern gate, his hair got caught in the eastern 
gate and he hung there for 40 days and 40 nights. And then because he was hang, hanging there for 40 days and 40 nights, he was so very hungry and the ravens came and fed him five loaves and two fishes. And uh, the next day, the three wise men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they came and they pulled him down and they put him on a boat to Nineveh. And as he reached Nineveh, he saw Jezebel, the queen, sitting on the city wall. And he told the people there, push her down, push her down. And they asked him, how many times should we push her? And he said, 70 times 7. So they said they pushed him 490 times. She fell down and, they, she, and she burst open. <laughs> and the remains they carried out in 12 baskets. And now I ask you the question, whose wife will she be in resurrection? And they were all like, what is happening? So they all had this discussion. And the chairman, you know, looking at all of the dazzled faces or bewildered faces, he said, he looks very young, but I think he knows the Bible. <laughs> Sometimes our biblical knowledge is that, you know, we have chunks of passages from here and there. We put them together. And uh, I remember one of my homiletics teachers, homiletics is basically, you know, how to <laughs> rightly, rightly interpret and then present uh, uh, the, the message properly. And one guy, you know, he was going all over the Bible. I still remember this distinct, nauseating comment that my professor gave. He said, your sermon, I'm sorry for using this, is like a dog's vomit. He said that. And it was, oh God. He said, you have everything. It's, 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 it's like whatever you have chewed, you have known, you have dumped it here without any order at all. And he gave this you know, very ugly imagery. Don't, don't visualize it, obviously. Okay. Yeah, the point is, you know, most of our understanding of the Bible is that. But yeah, he's got a point. Why is he being so verbose? You know what verbose is? Meaning so many words to explain something very simple. Simple words, they asked him, you know, why, what, what, what do you say about these accusations? And he is giving a, such a huge story from starting to begin, I'm sorry, from beginning to end. Why is he doing that? Because he wants to tell them, you talk about Moses, I know Moses better than you do. I know Abraham, I know about Jacob, I know everything about the history of Israel. And let me tell you, you are accusing me and I I'm going to accuse you. Look at the next verse, verse number 51. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Till now, they are the ones who have been accusing him. They are the ones who put him before the Sanhedrin. They are the ones who accuse him saying, this man spoke against Moses and the customs of Moses, the law of Moses. Now he turns around and says... It's not I who have broken the law, it is you. You have been rebellious people, you have been murderers. You not only murdered prophets, but you also murdered the one whom they were prophesying about. He says, you killed, look at that, he says, you killed the righteous one. Verse number 52, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. Anyone who even prophesied about this kingdom, about the Messiah who's going to bring about this kingdom, you kill them. They are accusing him of blasphemy. He is accusing them of murder. And this is why he's used that. He is saying, I am more of a Jew than you guys are. But I am, I know my scriptures, you are exploiting the scripture. That is what he is doing. You get the idea? An impartial Stephen is not partial, right? Because of, you know, full of grace, full of faith, full of power, full of the spirit. He is impartial. He knows the kingdom, the equality. And that is why he is chosen as one of the people who would be able to make that happen. The impactful Stephen, through his Life, his teachings, his proclamation, and through him the wonders being done. And therefore, people are being threatened, right? They are scared, and therefore they oppose him. He is very impacting. If there is no impact, people would not really bother, right? If you are no threat to anyone, no one is going to stand against you. Only if you are a threat, then people stand against you. He has been impactful. And now, when he is asked a question, he's almost, when I was reading, you know, I was almost thinking, this is the question that Stephen has been waiting for. When will they allow me to speak? Once you get that opportunity, he's so impressive, 
in his in his delivery in his oratory in his biblical knowledge you know scriptural understanding and pointing them pointing the right thing to them saying it's not i it is you almost convinced them and obviously it is not going to be taken well by these people an impartial stephen an impactful stephen an impressive stephen verse number 54 when the members of the sanhedrin heard this they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him so what is happening is they are very furious because he has pointed his fingers at them and he said you are the ones but stephen full of the spirit again look at look at the so many times it has been re- repeated full of the holy spirit meaning at that point of time he did not get uh, you know some kind of a new phenomenon or uh, something like that no what is happening is he was already full of the spirit because he was already godly he was already impartial he was already a person who knew the ideal of god and he was trying to put it into practice and here we find full of the holy spirit looked up to heaven and saw the glory of god and jesus standing at the right hand of god look he said i see i see heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of god and uh, here he has got a vision of god himself of jesus and god anyone who is proclaimed jesus as god these people are against because then if you believe that jesus is god then you have to follow his teachings and his teachings are going to be non exploitative against the exploitative religion and that is one of the reasons they don't want to accept him as god because if you accept him as god then you have to follow his teachings right now he in his vision he not only sees that vision he says i see heaven open and and the son of man standing at the right hand of god he is equating he is giving equal position to god and to jesus christ he is standing at the right hand of god jesus is standing at the right hand of god he is not a mere mortal let me tell you he is a deity he is god himself now again as every other apostle does he is elevating jesus to that even as they are about to kill him he has this vision and he is not ashamed to you know say it to people he is not perturbed by any of the problems that are arising because of preaching that jesus christ is god which is the fact which is something that we need to proclaim to the world and he is not going to back off just because they are going to throw stones at him look at that they have dragged him from the sanhedrin they are taking him some place and they are about to stone him as they and as, now as he said that they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices and when i was looking at that i was saying drama queen you know what drama queen is yeah too much of acting okay <laughs> right see as he was saying i see heaven open and son of man standing at the right hand of god at that they covered the areas and yelled at the top of their voices yeah too much of reaction right to dip- disproportionate to what is happening they are you know making such a big deal of that and they are dragging him to the city and meanwhile the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul again a very incidental detail but Saul is going to be talked about in detail later on this again i want you to know is that is another technique of look a peripheral character becomes a central character later on uh, Stephen was one among the seven he becomes the central character look at that yes he's here also he's introduced Saul as a man at whose feet you know they they put the cloaks and they are ab- about to uh, go and stone this guy and uh, p- he's going to be talked about later on that is just an incidental detail while they were stoning him Stephen prayed lord jesus receive my spirit then he fell on his knees and cried out lord do not hold this sin against them when he had said this he fell asleep what a beautiful passage where it talks about he stood his ground till the end it didn't matter he died with a smile on his face where he was almost saying even before i die i'm going to proclaim that jesus is god and i'm not going to back off i'm still going to say what he taught was the right thing that you need to follow as they are stoning him look at the magnanimity he is looking at these people who are killing him and he says do not hold it against them this is in fact being a disciple this is in fact being a disciple he is not given the title of an apostle but he definitely was definitely like jesus you know look at the same way he says he says father i give my spirit over to you jesus said right and this is what he is saying Lord Jesus receive my spirit what does it mean ah surrender submission and also saying i'm willing to do that it's not forced upon me i willingly give my life you get the idea it it shows that this man was so sold out that he was saying and that is why he is not angry against those people was his life taken by force yes it was they are taking it by force but according to him he is saying it doesn't matter i am giving it as though it is unforced i'm giving it as voluntarily i am doing it on my own that is why he is not holding it against them you get the idea when you think that someone is uh, forcing you to do something then you will be angry but you say yeah you forced me to do it but i'm going to just give it make a voluntary decision 
to give it. You want my cloak? And I think, you know, that is very forceful. I will be angry. But if I make a decision saying, okay, you want that cloak, I'll give that cloak. That makes, I, I will not have any anger against that person. Because you have made the decision out of your free will. Yes, you were forced, right? But at the same time, you, from your mind, you are saying, no, I'm not forced. I'm just going to give. This is what Stephen is doing, where he is such a wonderful character that nothing is deterring him from the faith. Can we be people like that? That we know the kingdom of God. We are working for the equality of people. We will not stand against equality. We will stand for equality. We will not stand for inequality. Not being partial. Can we be people who go about impacting the, impacting the society? It doesn't matter whether they are going to approve of you, put you on a pedestal, laud you, or they're going to persecute you. I'm going to be impactful. Can we be, you know, so impressive as this man was? Any opportunity that you got, he is using the scripture to prove to them he is being impressive. Yes, you know, impressive knowledge of the scripture. Do we have that? What about that immunity? When a problem comes, this is what my our mind says. You know, a problem comes, a persecution comes, we immediately say, God, come down, kill them. They are persecuting the church, but in fact... Being a Christian, being a true follower of Jesus Christ, being a part of the kingdom also has this in the job description. It has always been there in the job description. Okay, Whenever Jesus Christ, where people were, were wanting to follow him, he immediately disclosed to them that when you follow me, you will be hated because, because you are going to stand against a majority. This is something that he did. So it is not about, we need to have that. You know, all the prophets were already taught, you know, even in the book of Ezekiel, God has already told them, you know, go to your house, he says, you will be, you will be tied up by people, but I will not allow you to speak against them, God says. But I want you to correct them. I want you to help them be a part of the kingdom. But I will not allow you to rebuke them. This is a cost that you have to pay if you want to follow Jesus and be a part of the kingdom. But may God help us that we will understand, that we will learn, that maybe we will be able to imitate some of the things that Stephen did. Let's bow down our heads and look to the Lord in prayer.